Good day, everyone. My name is Brian Proppitt. I am with the Red Hat Open Source Program Office. Pleased to welcome you to another edition of Community Central. Before I introduce today's guests, I want to do the usual housekeeping notes. For those of you who are not familiar with our format, uh, we'll have a presentation, and then there will be a Q&A qu uh, session after that. If you have any questions for our presenter today, please use the Q&A tool that is um, in the prime time platform. Go ahead and fill this out. Vote on the ones you like the most. We will answer. We will ask the questions in the order of most light. So with the housekeeping out of the way, I am pleased to welcome my colleague from the Open Source Program Office, Mike Perez, also the CEF Community Manager. Mike, thanks for joining us today and thanks for the reschedule. Thank you, Brian, for having me. Really happy to be here. Thank you. Well, if you're all ready, go ahead and take it away. All right. Go ahead and share the screen here. All right. Are we all good there? We are good. Looks good to us. <clears throat> all right. Great. Thank you, Brian. All right, everyone. Well, welcome. I am going to be giving an intro talk to Ceph, which is a open source distributed storage system. And specifically, well, for myself, uh, why I'm talking about this, why you're hearing it from me. I am Mike Perez. Uh, I've been working on block storage on accident for some time in the OpenStack space. Started off in Nova Volume and integrating Ceph in there as well as helping to operate the first production OpenStack and Ceph cluster. And then later on served as a project technical lead for the block storage OpenStack project sender. And later on, I worked for the OpenStack Foundation itself as a cross project developer coordinator, helping with, of course, cross project initiatives. And then helping with the OpenStack technical committee, helping with governance. And presently I am part of the Red Hat Open Source Program Office and I serve as a community architect, focusing on Ceph, Rook, other storage projects that are adjacent to it, as well as uh, being a member of the Ceph Foundation board. So with Ceph, we're going to go over what exactly it is, why do we care about it, and then how it is set up as, you know, from a standpoint of the different components of it, with Rados, and then the different high-level storage interfaces that it provides, as well as the management. And then also we'll talk briefly on the community and the ecosystem around Ceph. So when we talk about Ceph, some of the buzzwords that people throw around are things like software-defined storage, unified storage systems, as well as scalable distributed storage. We gave ourselves with the trademark slogan of the future of storage, and some of us like to describe us as the Linux of storage. But when you get down to it, Ceph is open source software. It allows you to take commodity hardware, commodity servers, switches, hard drives, uh, device drives of any sorts, and that could be represented as a block device, and then taking those in and then representing them in these higher level storages that provide you both object and block and file level workloads. So Ceph is free and it's open source. It's free to use. It's free to modify and share out. You're free from vendor lock-in, so you could deploy Ceph on one particular vendor, and if you don't like a vendor, you could migrate over to another vendor that deploys Ceph, all within the same interfaces. And then it gives you the freedom to innovate with this uh, storage solution. So again, modifying and allowing changes through and improving it. And from day one, Ceph was, is meant to be reliable storage, it allows you to take, again, unreliable components and then create a reliable storage cluster with no single point of failure. And it gives you data durability through replication or erasure coding. And you can also do both if you want as well. There's no interruption of service uh, while you're doing rolling upgrades or while you're expanding out the cluster. And we favor consistency and correctness over performance. More on that. Stuff is scalable. It's elastic storage that allows you to take any sort of cluster, grow it, shrink it. You can add or remove hard, uh, hardware while it's online, while it's under heavy load. You could scale up to bigger, faster hardware later if you start with commodity hardware. You could scale out a single cluster for its capacity and performance, 
or you can even go for multiple clusters that are federated out that allow for asynchronous replications for your dis disaster recovery use cases. So Ceph is, as we said, it's unified storage system. So it allows you to take a storage cluster and then to have that available through these high level interfaces. So when you get down to it, we start off with Rados, which then speaks out to the different interfaces that we'll go over. These interfaces provide different use cases for requirements for applications, whether they wanna to speak to the data over S3 or Swift compatible interface, as well as with a Rados block device to allow you to create volumes, attach to those volumes, and you can attach those volumes to bare metal machines, virtual machines, containers, and then the file level storage itself, which allows you to have a, a coherent interface to have a POSIX compliant file system so that you can have directory shares out uh, for those type of uh, workloads. And all of this is working with Rados, which is a reliable atomic distributed object storage. And it takes a common storage layer and gives you object block and file level storage. This is the low level storage right here. So it's reliable, it's highly available, scalable from day one. And it is what handles all the replication and erasure coding, data placement, and rebalancing, and the repairing that happens in the cluster. And you know, following in with the CAP theorem, this is a consistency or CP, not AP. So, and this with this sort of design, we could separate out the separation of the replication from these high level file level storages so that they're not handling it. Simplifies the design. Stuff is broken out into these different components that are distributed within the pool. So, for example, we have the Ceph monitor, which does all the authenticating from the beginning as well as data placement and policies, coordinates all that. And from there, it provides you um, a state of the cluster through a mapping, which we'll go over later. And typically you have about three to seven of these per cluster for redundancy. We have the manager as well, which provides you capabilities from uh, one of the recent Ceph talks that we talked about with Ceph ADM, for example, the deployment tool. And so the manager allows you the ability to go ahead and coordinate and orchestrate out uh, to deploying your Ceph cluster through such interfaces. And then what makes up most of the cluster is these object storage daemons, which are usually mapped to a device such as a hard drive, a solid state drive, whatever it may be. And this is what's actually serving the IO requests to the client. So from the client perspective, it's one big pool, one big cluster but it's speaking out to these OSDs to doing the actual writes. And so your cluster can have tens to thousands of these, depending on how big your cluster is. And so, you know, from a legacy standpoint, how we usually architect these sort of solutions is creating a illusion to the application itself. Typically you would have application reaching out through some sort of virtual IP and this virtual IP is gonna have a bunch of failover gateway nodes, which allow you to write to the actual backends. And this sort of solution has served us well over decades. However, it is limiting in its design as well as in performance. So Steph takes a different approach. From the application standpoint, you are speaking out to the cluster, not necessarily concerned about where exactly the data is written from the application. It's all taken care of by the client. and out to, these, out to the actual Rados cluster, and then it's replicated out. And so when we're writing these data objects, where does the data actually go to? Where does it get stored? How does that get figured out? In legacy setups, you would typically have a lookup step, which would involve another network hop to go to say a metadata server, and then that metadata server will provide you the location of where that data is located or where it should be written to. And unfortunately, like this sort of step, you know, it gives you one additional network hop. Plus it, it starts getting hard to scale once you try to keep track of all these different datas or all these different objects when you have trillions of them. So from a calculator placement, Steph does a different approach. It uses uh, Crush instead. And so it gets a map 
which I mentioned earlier, from the monitor when it wants to do a read or write request. From there, that map is used along with a calculator approach using the object name. And we go ahead and do that hash uh, calculator approach. And then with the mapping, we're able to know exactly where the data should be written to. And if one of those nodes was to actually go down, or OSDs rather, was to go down that the data was to be written to, the application itself is able to go ahead and fetch another mapping from the monitor that's updated, do another calculation, and then go ahead and do the read and writes from there. Important to note though, that the application from here on is just writing directly to the storage devices themselves. So this approach uh, of getting the mapping is required every time. And what are these RADOS objects? So RADOS objects are different from when we're talking about the RADOS gateway or S3 or Swift uh, kind of compatible storage. These are not the same object storage. This is the underlying, you know, low level storage that stuff makes sense of all the different, you know, bytes of data that exists out. So what these typically are is the name itself of the device or the name itself. So it might be something represented like so with a bunch of numbers at the end. And all of these are mapped to an object. It's uh, mapped to, to a file itself, which I'll break it down in a second. But these contain the actual analogous sort of uh, attributes to a file system that you would expect. And what makes up most of these, these uh, object data is the actual byte data itself. So these are usually about four megs and or another approach could be is taking like a flat file, which would have a bunch of key values. This is similar to like having a flat file database, like a NoSQL approach uh, called OMAP. And so these are two different, you don't usually do these at the same time, but you can have these different ways that these objects are stored. And then these objects themselves live inside of pools, which we'll go over later. So breaking it down, you have, say, some files that you want to store. And if you want to take one of these files, they'll get broken up into a bunch of objects, which I mentioned will all end with different numbers. And then from there, these objects get put into a pool, which contains a bazillion of these objects once your data grows. And these get placed out into placement groups. And placement groups are great because they allow us to set policies of how exactly we want the data stored. So if you think of an approach of like how things are stored in a data center or uh, in a hierarchy standpoint, you have a you have different racks and uh, different data centers. And then in these data centers, you have the racks, the nodes, and then you might want to have the data separated out into different racks within the data center or even different rooms in the data center. The placement group policies allow you to do this, and the placement groups allow you to allow these to be enforced based on this crush uh, algorithm that I spoke about earlier. And from there, these object data are split out into OSDs and replicated out. <laughs> so for replication, there are two different approaches that can happen. Uh, each RADIS pool must be, you know, at the beginning, very durable. And so we want to replicate out in the first approach, three different copies. And this is going to give you a 200% overhead because it's taking, you know, an exact identical copy of the data object itself. These, uh, this is great because it allows you to do faster recoveries because you just have to copy this over to another OSD. Uh, to make sure that the replication factor is being met. However, like I said, there is a 200% overhead since we do have to have three copies of this usually. And you can also change the replication factor. You know, you can have uh, four or five copies, whatever you may need. And then along with erasure coding, the so erasure coding uh, gives you these, uh, what I like to, uh, how I like to put it is like these four shards of the actual data object itself being split apart. And what's great with this approach is you have these four shards plus these two parity uh, files right here that allow you to, if you lose one of these uh, files, 
you could or on one of these devices you could go ahead and you could read back the data and to actually write this appropriate file back and so in this particular case this is a, a four plus two uh, sort of uh, schema right here and uh, but yeah like I said you can use both of these in conjunction although typically you pick one or the other and this allows you for a less overhead as opposed to having identical copies of the data and having shards of the data split out instead. So Rados is kind of magic because it gives you this idea of having virtualized storage pools. You can have different, different types of pools with different types of devices and using those policies, uh, the, the placement group policies, you can actually have different workloads being put into different pools that have different hardware devices to serve different requirements that clients may need. So we talked about Rados and how the data is actually stored uh, in stuff itself, but how does it get interacted with applications? So Rados Gateway is one approach. This is uh, an S3 and Swift compatible object storage provided over HTTPS REST-based interface. And ideally you have a bunch of these Rados gateways that are serving behind a load balancer. And then they speak the LibRados API to actually write out to the Rados cluster itself. And then you get all that re-replication features since it's storing the Rados itself. And with the Rados gateway, different approach of instead of having directories of files and having volumes. Instead, you have an HTTP interface with buckets. And in these buckets, you can put in objects, more flat-based, and these can be accessed over, you know, by a secret key or an access key that is provided by the Ceph cluster. And like I mentioned before, Rados Gateway objects are not the same as the Rados Gateway, or sorry, the Rados storage itself. These uh, tend to be very big as opposed to the Rados objects themselves tend to be four megs. And then along with the Rados gateway, you can have uh, also have these federated into different zones. You can also have them federated out into different data centers. And then all of this is, you know, replicated asynchronous, excuse me, asynchronously across to the other data centers as well. And then, so I spoke about how it is S3 compatible. And one of the ways that we're able to ensure this is with an S3 test framework. And we have, as we found, we uh, have other open source projects that use this as well to ensure functional testing with S3 as the interface changes. Uh, you can also have secure token services. So if you wanna use some other third party authentication that is allowed with Redis Gateway, uh, there's encryption, compression, and then there's also the static website hosting. So you can actually, you know, host a static website off of this, uh, off of the Rados Gateway itself. And then there's also the ability to have notifications served off of Rados Gateway. And one of, a feature I really like with the Rados Gateway itself is having the ability to have lifecycle management with a particular object. Um, you can have these objects uh, go ahead and place at different storage tiers or they can expire based on a particular time. You can also have an, an archival zone with Redis Gateway so you can have an exact copy and changes of every single object that happens in the history of your cluster. Uh, next I'll talk about the Redis block device interface. So, the Rados block device interface is uh, allows you to have volumes, and these volumes, as I mentioned before, are uh, created as set size, and then they could be extended out. They could be attached to virtual machines, containers, whatever it may be. And this is implemented specifically in KVM with KRBD, and it's integrated with Libvirt, OpenStack, and Kubernetes, and a variety of others. And I would also like to point out that according to the, uh, the OpenStack user survey, the Ceph uh, RBD solution is used by more than half of the clusters reported. So 
So another ability is having the is being able to create snapshots of these volumes at a particular point in time. These are read only snapshots. But what's great is you can also do clones of particular volumes. And then these clones end up, uh, it's basically a free uh, copy where essentially the copy happens instantly. And then all the writes happen on top of that and get logged. And then from there, you don't have, it's a zero copy. So uh, the creation happens instantly. And then along with that, you know, with RBD, you also have the same similar features of being able to mirror out a particular cluster. So asynchronous replications are happening to another RBD cluster. So you can have one in a different room, data center uh, for disaster recovery cases. You can view all of the IO activity that is happening uh, in the RBD interface with RBD top. Quotas are enforced just the same. And yeah, along with that, um, so I mentioned this could be spoken a little bit differently from the object storage. This is uh, connected through sort of with uh, the kernel uh, kernel client itself of KRBD. You can also use MBD as well as the iSCSI, the Linux IO uh, stack interface as well to do iSCSI. And you can also use libRBD directly itself, but all these solutions use libRD itself. And then CephFS, the file level storage. This is the distributed network file system, provides you a POSIX compliant file system. Uh, this gives you, you know, all of your metadata of files, directories, rename, hard links. Um, it gives you a, all your attributes to your files as you would expect them to. And what's different from this interface compared to other interfaces is that it gives you a consistent coherent caching. And the way that the namespace is actually scaled out is by this way of that we do subtree partitioning. And so for each of these different types of workloads, uh, we have a metadata server dedicated to different types of uh, workloads based on how active they are. So if you have one particular you know, directory that's being accessed a lot, it might have a metadata server that is dedicated to just that workload. So when the files are being accessed, it has a dedicated metadata server. And then for files that aren't accessed as, as often, they might have a shared metadata server to be reached out to. And CephFS allows you also to have the ability to do snapshots uh, within the file system itself. So you can take for this a particular example of going into a particular directory inside of the file system, uh, doing an LS. And so we'll see that we have a dot snap directory. We can create a my snapshot directory. And then if we go ahead and LS in it there and we'll remove the original file foo from the original directory, we could go into that snapshot that we just created and the foo directory, or sorry, the foo file will be available again. Another neat feature is when you are mounting a set file system, you can use this R bytes uh, feature right here. And what this allows you to do is get at, uh, file attributes, specifically getting a actual usage look into all these directories when you do an LS. Only problem though, is that this feature confuses our sync, so we leave it off by default, but hope to have it enabled in a future release. Some of the other features in CephFS, uh, you know, I mentioned the snapshots that you can create. Uh, you get the extended attributes. You can have file locking done. Quotas are available just the same. You can have multiple storage tiers as you can with other interfaces. And for your high performance computing cases, you can turn on uh, lazy IO to uh, relax to enforce consistency by CephFS. And accessing CephFS is, you know, the same way you're doing a mount with a mon uh, monitor IP into the actual directory that you want to mount. Uh, it can be accessed through your CephFuse if you need to. NFS works as well. This and lips 
and management. So the dashboard is uh, our, one of our graphical user interfaces for managing Ceph. Uh, you can, a lot of the abilities, functions that you get from Ceph ADM to manage the different manager demons, all that functionality could come out of here. It gives you a listing of the cluster status as well. And uh, yeah. Installation by Ceph could be done by a couple of different ways. One of them, if you're uh, using Kubernetes, is using the project Rook, which allows you to deploy Ceph and have the different components containerized into the different Kubernetes pods. And, or you can use Ceph ADM itself, which allows you to work with the Ceph, uh, the Ceph managers to actually deploy out the cluster uh, through the command line. And as I mentioned before, if you have the dashboard up, you can also provision your cluster that way with Ceph ADM. And then we have some other legacy uh, configuration management tools that exist as well. Uh, there's Ceph Ansible, DeepSea, and Puppet. So on the community and ecosystem, uh, as I already mentioned, Ceph is open source. It's uh, mostly LGBL3, and we collaborate via GitHub. We have a tracker for all of our bug requests that is stored on Redmine. And all of the discussions happen on the mailing list through dev at ceph.io, and we're on IRC on Ceph Debel, IRC OFTC. And we have a lot of meetings that we take place in the community around performance, the Ceph orchestrator, and then we have talks that are given by community members on what they're doing with Ceph, as well as code walkthroughs to give people more insight on how they could contribute to Ceph in the code base. We publish all of our packages uh, up on the website as well, as well, the different builds, CentOS and Ubuntu, and then we work with some other downstream uh, distributions as well. And we integrate with a variety of different adjacent projects. I mentioned OpenStack, where we're heavily involved in um, since way beginning, and then even with Kubernetes and Rook, and then our integration into the kernel itself and in KVM. And some of the events that are taking place right now, we have the Ceph Month, which is uh, it's a little bit different of what we have done in the past, where we're collecting presentations, unconference events, and we want to collect them for a month-long event, schedule them out, and through the Ceph community calendar, we're accepting talks right now. Uh, there's a link for submission. The deadline date is May 12th. And last, we have the Ceph Developer Summit, which already occurred for the Quincy release. That's uh, happened April 6th through the 9th, and, but all those recordings can be found on the Ceph YouTube channel. And those contain all the discussions of what is to come in the Quincy roadmap for Ceph. And uh, <laughs> we haven't had these events, unfortunately, in a while, but we hope to have them again soon. So we have the Ceph Days, which is a one-day regional event that occurs somewhere. And we usually have 10 of these per year. They're usually around to two, uh, 100 to 200 people. And there's a single track, and it's all focused around users around Ceph. So we would like to have these again at some point, as well as our Cephalcon event, which is our much larger event once per year in the spring. So look out for those. And the Ceph Foundation. The Ceph Foundation was created uh, and it has 35 members as an unbiased entity to hold on to the trademark with Ceph, but as well as to uh, help promote community events and basically branding around Ceph. And the event planning upstream CI infrastructure, which we have also improved greatly uh, thanks to the participation of the Ceph Foundation Board. And here is a listing of the current members that we have right now for Ceph Foundation. And if you would like any more information, you can find us on Ceph.io, Ceph website, Ceph Twitter, 
And like I said, we're mostly on the mailing list and IRC. And find us on GitHub, as well as check the Ceph YouTube channel. Uh, we do post there quite often with content every week. So. Thank you. Okay, Mike, thank you very much for your presentation. We have a couple of questions coming in. Um, and again, a reminder, if you have questions for Mike about stuff, get them into the Q&A tool and we'll get them answered for you. So Matthew starts out with, you mentioned Ceph ABM as modern and Ceph Ansible as legacy. Is there a plan at Red Hat to move away from Ceph Ansible? So I, I'm not speaking on anything officially, so I, I don't know what the, the plans are for Red Hat itself. But um, as I understand, Ceph ADM is something that is being evaluated as being a deployment tool for uh, Red Hat storage products. But um, otherwise, right now, Ceph Ansible does continue to still get developed, though, and it's still supported. So. I do mention legacy, but it's just as an upstream community, the more of the efforts are being focused on the core team on this particular deployment tool. And thank you for the question. Yes, indeed. So Mark asks, how does Ceph deploy, which is featured in the upstream docs, differ from Ceph Ansible, which seems to be the method that we, and I'm assuming that's Red Hat, ships and supports? Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, Ceph Ansible is, of course, using a configuration management tool, Ansible, as we know. And um, so the uh, Ceph deploy was mentioned in the question. I wanted to say right off that we currently do not support Ceph deploy anymore. We support Ceph ADM over to Ceph deploy. That is, um, I would say that's actually more categorized as a legacy client as like, do not use it, um, use Ceph ADM. Um, and of course, like I said, their Steph Ansible is still being supported. I don't want to confuse people with thinking that it's, uh, you know, unsupported, but it's just there is less focus in the community on it um, in favor of the Ceph ADM tool. Now, the differences with Ceph ADM and Ceph Ansible, um, I, I would say, you know, with Ceph ADM, you get a command line interface that you can orchestrate the deployment for your Ceph cluster. And Ceph Ansible, you got what playbooks that come in YAML format to do those deployments themselves. Uh, one of the great things, though, with Ceph ADM, though, is that it does give you the ability to interact with it with YAML files. You, there was a presentation that just got posted today, actually, on the Ceph YouTube channel going over Ceph ADM. But it breaks down basically, you can have, you can pass it YAML uh, syntax, and just the same that you would do for, say, if you're familiar with like Kubernetes cube control or something like that, and you can pass it those YAML files to instruct it how it should deploy your Ceph cluster. They're different types of tools though, so it's kind of hard to make a comparison on the different ones of like why use one or the other. Uh, right now, from my understanding though, it's just, there's more of a focus on this particular tool now. Okay, Ahmad has, or Ahmed, sorry, has a, a question. Um, so Ceph is now part of the new Red Hat ODF. Which version and how compatible is this with the, with deployments of, of Ceph? And I'm assuming he's talking about the ODF. Um. Sorry, I need a little help with this one. Uh, can I get more background on this? That's all I've got, really. So, uh, Ahmed, if you want to put that into the chat and. Um, oh, you know. Federico says downstream questions. Um, should go to him. Okay. So, Ahmed, you should reach out to Federico, uh, uh, <laughs> who's in chat, and definitely ask him the downstream question there. So, yep. I think we got that one taken care of, but thank you for the question anyway. Um, that's all the questions we have from the audience. So I'm I'm curious, Mike. So you you know I know Pacific is coming out the new release. Like what what features are are you and the team most excited about? Yeah, and you know, I would say in Ceph Pacific, 
specifically, um, you can check the Ceph blog. There's been some uh, a lot of performance, uh, I, I would say, research around different schedulers that are being used with Ceph um, to help with accessing data faster. I would take a look at the uh, the recent blog post with MCLOCK scheduler. Been a lot of uh, focus in there. And then uh, I've been noticing a lot more focus this time around in CephFS. There's the new CephFS mirroring feature that I mentioned, which gives you the idea to have federated clusters um, around CephFS. So you have the asynchronous replicated data to another cluster. Uh, those would be my biggest focuses, I, I would say, uh, for this release. And then um, Quincy, uh, I need to get myself more familiarized with Quincy, but like I mentioned before, the Ceph Developer Summit just occurred. Uh, you can take a look at the Ceph YouTube channel and take a look at the roadmap that the group has came up with of what's going to be coming up for Quincy. Okay. Um, Ahmed has another question. You mentioned the details of writing objects in Ceph. What about reading back and performance? Does it do voting or reading from one copy or consulting all three copies of the object? Uh, yeah, so um, so since you have a bunch of these different, uh, you know, separated out object data, it's, you know, we have to read back, you know, um, since these rec you know usually represent about four megs of the actual data itself, it's going to be you know hundreds of these that you need to read back in order to actually have the data 100% back together. And so when the when the when the client is actually doing the calculation of crush based on the object name and the current mapping of the cluster able to then go ahead and do a lookup of which actual node OSD can have the actual data itself to read it back. And so that is all calculated on that one approach. And I would say that that's one of Seth's most significant features right there is being able to do the calculated approaches of where exactly to write the data and where to actually read the data based on that, on that algorithm. And not having to do a metadata lookup server um, to accomplish that. Okay, good to know. Well, that is all of the questions that we have um, from our audience. Um, I want to thank everybody for uh, jumping in and giving some questions to Mike. And of course, thank you so much to my guest, Mike Perez um, from the Ceph Project uh, for coming on today and giving us a great update on what's going on with Ceph. All right. Thank you again for having me, Brian, and thank you, everybody. Have a nice one. All right. You all take care, and we'll be back at our regular time this Thursday with another edition of Community Central. Until then, be safe and have a great day.